Welcome to SpyCast, the official podcast of the International Spy Museum. I'm Erin Dietrich, and your host is Dr. Andrew Hammond, the museum's historian and curator. Each week, we explore some aspect of the past, present, or future of intelligence and espionage. If you enjoy the episode, please consider leaving us a five-star review. And if you want to dig even deeper into the content of this episode, you can find links to further resources, suggested readings, and full transcripts at cyberwire.com slash podcasts slash spycast. Coming up next on SpyCast. One of the other things that Anne Fleming uh, requires, or required for them to go forward with these continuation novels, is that the family had to read them and vet them. And if they didn't like them, they couldn't be published. And that's actually what happened. This week's guest is Mark Edlitz, director, author, and James Bond fan extraordinaire. Mark is the author of The Many Lives of James Bond, How the Creators of Bond Decoded the Super Spy, and The Lost Adventures of James Bond. He joined Andrew to talk about his new book, Bond After Fleming, which explores the trajectory of the world's most famous spy in fiction after the death of its creator, Ian Fleming. In this week's episode, you'll learn about the original Fleming novels, intellectual property and author's rights to iconic characters, the evolution of Bond as a literary character, the relationship between the Bond books and the Bond movies, the questions, can icons truly ever die, and how malleable are our favorite characters. The original podcast on intelligence since 2006, We Are SpyCast. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, I'm really excited to speak to you about your Bond After Fleming book and about all of the research and work that you've done on James Bond. So tell us a little bit more uh, about this book. How did you come to write it? What's the book about? Uh, just give us the headline, so to speak. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is my third book on James Bond. The first one was primarily about the films and it included interviews with actors who played James Bond in different media. It's called The Many Lives of James Bond. And the second one was about more overlooked aspects of James Bond and it was called The Lost Adventures of James Bond. Bond, and it was about Timothy Dalton's third film about Bond in comics, Bond on radio. And I figured, what else has not been said about James Bond? And the answer is very little. It's a well-worn topic. However, nobody's ever written a book on the James Bond continuation novels. And so I thought I could add to the Bond literary bookshelf with my book, James Bond After Fleming. So I think I should just mention to listeners that you got some really great interviews for the Many Lives of James Bond book. Um, people like Roger Moore, George Lazenby, David Niven, some of the directors and so forth. So how did you manage to get these people? How did you talk them into speaking to you? That is a very good question, and I'm not sure I have the right answer for it. <laughs> Uh, then uh, I reached out to them uh, sincerely and uh, enthusiastically. And uh, I was very lucky in, in the, the number of people who, who agreed to speak with me. Sincere enthusiasm goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, move on to your current book, so Bond After Fleming. So uh, the way that you've described it to me is that it's a literary overview of all of the novels that come after the death of the author and originator of James Bond, Ian Fleming. So before we go on that journey, can you just tell our listeners a little bit more about Ian Fleming? Just in case they're a little bit rusty on this, how many novels did he write? Where did it all come from? When did he stop? Who picked up the bat on first, etc.? So Ian Fleming is, of course, the creator of James Bond. He wrote 12 novels and two collections of short stories. The first novel is Casino Royale, and that came out in 1953. And the last James Bond novel, The Man with the Golden Gun, was published in 1965, a year after Fleming died. Fleming died in 1964 with a not-quite-complete manuscript to The Man with the Golden Gun. 
And so the estate wanted to make sure it was published, and but it wasn't quite finished. There's a, you know, even though the story's all there, still needs to be edited. And they turned to Kingsley Amos, the noted author, for editorial notes, not to rewrite it, not to make it, you know, what would you do differently? Um, although he did have suggestions along those lines. But they really said, in terms of keeping it as a pure editing proposition, what would you do Kingsley Amos? And the reason they turned to Kingsley Amos is because he had written a couple of books that were best described as Bond appreciation books, uh, where he went into the, the, the novels that Fleming had written and said really about, about what they did well and what he liked about the character. He also wrote a tongue-in-cheek uh, guide to being the James Bond lifestyle, uh, which was written as if it were written by one of Bond's work colleagues. So he had the, the not only was he a noted author, but he uh, had the Bond bona fides, and he also uh, knew Fleming. So um, he helped edit that book. And then they published another book uh, of short stories called Octopussy and the Living Daylights. And there were no more Bond books or stories penned by Fleming. And then the question is, well, what happens to the character James Bond? Does it die with the, with its creator and author, or is there a way to continue? Now, Ian Fleming was married to Anne Fleming, his wife, and during his lifetime, she was not a fan of the James Bond character. Uh, it was not the kind of literary writing that she best appreciated. She thought it was... You know, she it, they were thriller writing, and it it wasn't um, it wasn't a literary book. So just briefly, Mark. So for her, it wasn't the right genre, or she just thought it was too lowbrow, or both. She thought it was too lowbrow. Yeah, yeah. She thought it was too lowbrow. She thought it was also distracting Ian Fleming from you know other things that he should be doing. Uh, but she just thought it was too lowbrow, plainly speaking. But she did. That's not necessarily the reason why she didn't want the the character to continue. She felt, as many people did, that James Bond came from Ian Fleming. That James Bond was a reflection of Ian Fleming's interests and likes and tastes, and that all over the, the, the writing. So she argued fairly: How can we continue? Maybe we shouldn't continue. I don't want to continue. Let's not continue. While this was going on, there were other people who were trying to insert James Bond into their novels or people who had aspirations of writing either a James Bond novel itself or, as I said, inserting the James Bond character into another novel, including, from, including internationally. So now there's a problem where there is an interest and a demand for James Bond's continuing adventures, but... So what are you going to do about it? And the estate felt like it was necessary to, to continue. Uh, and then, so there were two first James Bond post-Fleming works. One of them was a, a James Bond novel by Kingsley Amos, the guy who edited The, the Man with the Golden Gun, called Colonel Sun. But before that, there was another book uh, called The Adventures of James Bond Jr., 003 and a Half. That was 1967. Colonel Sun was 1968. So the first James Bond post-Fleming book was this Hardy Boy-style adventure book called 003 and a Half, or the, the Adventures of James Bond Jr. And when you say the estate, do you mean... Is that, is that his wife? Is, or like how are his wife and the estate different, if at all? So before Fleming died, he bought a company called Glid Rose Productions. For, he did this for tax reasons, and he put the literary copyright for Bond in Glid Rose. Obviously, everyone knows that he sold the, the movie copyright to other people. Uh, Broccoli and Saltzman, who made the James Bond films, got the bulk of it, although there was one or two that were outside of that. 
Glid Rose Productions was a, as I said, was, was created to protect his taxes, really. He was being charged something like 95% on his taxes. And by putting the copyright into Glid Rose, he was able to shield himself in part because he knew this was two years before Casino Royale and he knew that success or he anticipated that success was coming. Shortly before his death, he sold Glid Rose to Booker, which was a, a or Booker McConnell, which was a trading company or a sugar firm uh, in an unusual move to, 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 to protect his taxes. Now, they had, Booker had not done that before, but now Booker, this company, was in charge of 51% of the character of James Bond. The other 49% was uh, held by Ian Fleming's, while well, he was, Ian Fleming while he was alive, and then it went on to his, his, his wife and son. And so there's two entities, uh, Glid Rose Productions became Glid Rose Publications, uh, and then it became Ian Fleming Publications. Ian Fleming Publications is really owned by the Fleming family or the Fleming estate, and, and Ian Fleming P Publications manages it for the family. And so they're, they, they really, they're, there's not too much daylight between those two parties. So just to put it in perspective, I'm assuming that the the family and descendants of 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 Ian Fleming. I'm assuming that theoretically they don't they wouldn't have to work. I'm assuming that money just continues to cascade in for them over the years, does it? The descendants are are, are in fact wealthy, but but it's not the Fleming books that necessarily drive that. Although the, you know money does come in. They sold an interest to, to uh, one bank to another bank, and so they became fabulously wealthy for from that sale. So their interest in in the in Fleming is really comes from a place of preserving his legacy. It, it really comes from love. It is not a primarily financially motivated endeavor, although of course they want to make money and they want to make sure that that's done correctly. But it, it's not that money that they're relying on to pay the bills. It's a fascinating family story, isn't it? I think his grandfather is, uh, comes down from Scotland, makes money, and Ian Fleming goes to good schools. And then from there, the descendants of Ian Fleming, they sell one banking interest to another bank, and money comes from that. But it all comes from this initial journey to England. It's a fascinating family story, I think. Oh, it's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. And the, their interest, my belief, in, in, in these continuation novels is a way to preserve and protect Fleming's legacy. Uh, it, it's, it, it's important to, you know, to protect the copyright, but having these literary works out there is what keeps the focus on the novels so that it's not just the movies that people think about when they think of James Bond. And so then there's 50 continuation novels and spin-off works and short stories that fall into different categories. There's about 27 or 28 uh, novels that focus on the adult Bond. And then there's nine about young Bond, James Bond, which is to say James Bond in his teen years. There's three... Uh, about Miss Moneypenny, which are called the Moneypenny Diaries. There is a new trilogy of books being coming out now by Kim Sherwood about the other agents in the 00 division. There's that children's book, 003 and a half. Uh, there's a, a no novella. So there's all these, uh, there's novelizations, you know, there's all, all this great stuff to talk about. The other double, 007s, that's, those are quite interesting. Um, we can come back to them, but one of them's on a uh, someone who's gay, one of them's on a Muslim, one of them's on a woman. So, so they're really broadening and broadening out the aperture that that Fleming started with. You know, I want to come back to this, but what does the family make of this broadening? Because the James Bond from, say, Casino Royale or Doctor No, 
is different from the bond that we're seeing on the screens anyway uh, more recently. And of course, there's always talk in the news that is James Bond becoming, you know, quote unquote woke? Uh, is James Bond really becoming someone that we don't recognize anymore and so forth? Is the, is the, the estate or the, or the, the family or the, or the thoughts on that in terms of Fleming's legacy? Is this a, a development they support or they're quiet on or they're against it or is it more complicated than that? No, they, they, they definitely support it. The, these are books and initiatives that are only done with the support of the family. One of the, one of the other things that Anne Fleming uh, requires or required for them to go forward with these continuation novels is that the family had to read them and vet them. And if they didn't like them, they couldn't be published. And that's actually what happened. Uh, you know, the, I said Cur Colonel Sun was the first adult one that came out, but there was another one called Per Fine Ounce that was written by an author who, who he said it was at the suggestion of Ian Fleming. And the estate commissioned the, the author to write it. He, the author handed in the book, Per Fine Ounce, and they rejected it. So there, there is a mechanism in place to stop works that they don't want. But even before they get to the point of asking a writer to write something, the ideas need to get approved of by the estate. Wow. So if I wanted to go out and write, write a James Bond novel just now <laughs> and independently publish it, 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 I would just get a massive lawsuit, basically. You, you cannot. You cannot the, do the, it. The, no. I mean, you, you, you could write it for fun and, and keep it on your computer, but if you it, attempted to disseminate it and sell it is where you'd run afoul because James Bond is right now a, co a character under copyright. So only... Uh, authorized people can write and sell James Bond books in in most countries. And it will be like that for like 85 years and then it will be open season? TBD. TBD, okay. Uh, you know, like you see it with uh, Sherlock Holmes, where the estates, the Sherlock Holmes, I believe, is now completely in the, I think as of 2023, I, I might be wrong about this, I think at least since 2023, he's a public domain character. He might have been, um, there might be a few books that are still under copyright, but at least the majority of them are not. But the, that family still, the Conan Doyle family still manages it. But you also see different um, Holmes iterations on, in TV and movies. He's, he's well represented. And I mean, just before we get on to the Bond after Fleming part, I mean, as an interesting question that you raised earlier, Anne's point, the family's initial point, this was what Ian Fleming did. This is the way that it should stay. I mean, you wouldn't send the descendants of William Shakespeare out to write the continuation plays or, you know, what happened to X character afterwards and, and some new playwright imagines it. I mean, it just, it just wouldn't happen. So it is an interesting question. Well, the, the 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 purpose of a copyright enables it's a way to incentivize creators to have ownership of their work for for many years, and then after a certain while, you know, we've seen it with that that one iteration of Mickey Mouse. You know, they do go into the public domain, and now there's plenty of characters in the in the public domain. Santa Claus is in the public domain, and you could do what you could tell any kind of Santa Claus story that you want. It could be a horror film. It could be a family film. But with James Bond, it, it, I, I think there's a huge benefit in having someone, in my opinion, having an entity to control it because uh, there's some sort of oversight and they, they are trying to keep true to Fleming. One of the things that the family insists on, I, I wouldn't say insist on, but expects, they expect all the continuation continuation authors to go back and read Fleming before they start writing the new thing. They frequently send them a, a box set of all the Fleming James Bond novels and you know, say, "Enjoy." Um, and then they and the, the the writers do they they read them all, and they get their inspiration from Fleming. The the continuation novels do not reference 
each other for the most part. You know, you'll see, sometimes you'll see a sly reference or sometimes Raymond Benson will talk about John Gardner's villain or Bond or, or, or love interest. But as a, as a real practical matter, these are all discrete works and the canons do not overlap. So we're, we're used to seeing Marvel and Star Wars where what happens to Darth Vader in, in, in the video game is sort of what's supposed to have happened to him in, in the movies and they're not supposed to violate anything. The only thing that the continuation authors must do is not violate Fleming. So on a small level, that means if Bond likes coffee and not tea, their Bond has to also like coffee and not tea. Okay. So, so like the, the, the character in the continuation novels would still have the martini is shaken, not stirred sort of thing? Absolutely, absolutely. To help you digest this episode, here is a brief interlude on James Bond. James Bond was born in Philadelphia in the year 1900 and would go on to be the curator of ornithology at the Academy of Natural Sciences. He was also the leading authority on the birds of the Caribbean for half a century. He visited more than 100 Caribbean islands and his expertise was captured in his classic 1936 book, Birds of the West Indies. This is where the fictional and much more famous James Bond would get his name. Ian Fleming came across this book, a keen bird watcher himself, and recounted, It struck me that this brief, unromantic, Anglo-Saxon, and yet very masculine name was just what I needed. And so, a second James Bond was born. The author of Birds of the West Indies, then, was the real James Bond, And one day in 1964, the real Ian Fleming met the real James Bond for the one and only time when the latter came with his wife to Fleming's Golden Eye Estate in the north of Jamaica. And let's pivot back to Kingsley Amos. So he's the he's the first, more or less the first person to pick up the baton that, that Fleming left. So he's a friend of Fleming. He's Sir Kingsley Amos, one of the, the, the biggest figures in post-war British fiction, right? Can you just tell our listeners a little bit more about that first iteration and a little bit more about Kingsley Amos? Well, he, he, he came from the angry young man authors. And one of the things that you'll see in Anne Fleming's letters is she's, she sort of pokes fun at that. And I think in one of the letters, she says something like, oh, he, he was not nearly as angry as I imagined. The first James Bond novel, adult James Bond novel, Colonel Sun, is a quasi-loose sequel to The Man with the Golden Gun, the last Ian Fleming novel. And Bond's recovering from the gunshot wound that that he sustained while battling Scaramanga. And he's feeling a little bit worse for wear. And it's it's a really fun book because two important things happen in that book. One within, it starts off with Bond and Tanner, his friend in the service, Bill Tanner, playing golf. And then Bond goes to M's house and M's been kidnapped. So that's one important thing because uh, it's a way to incorporate, to personalize the mission for James Bond. Normally, M's the guy who sends Bond out on these missions. And here's a a way to create a new wrinkle to the story. Uh, And this idea of M being kidnapped is something that we see in the James Bond movie, The World Is Not Enough, when Dame Judi Dench is kidnapped and Pierce Brosnan has to go to save her. And then the other thing that happens of, of, of interest in, in that first one is this incredible torture scene where Bond gets, I don't know how to best describe it, sort of like a, a long spike gets placed in his ear and even up his nose. And it's so he's being tortured for the, usually with, with a spike in his ear, 
And usually the villain wants information from Bond, and that's the purpose of torturing him. But this, but this sadistic vil, villain, Colonel Sun, is just doing it for the sheer pleasure of doing it. And this scene and a few of the lines were adapted in Spectre, the, the, the Daniel Craig, James Bond movie, when Blofeld gets him and he's, he's putting a needle in his ear. And that's really the, and if you see at the end of the credits of Spectre, they say, thanks to the Kingsley Amos estate, you know, some, some version of that. And that's the only official adaptation of a James Bond continuation novel into the Bond movies. Other than that moment of the, the ear torture, there's never been an official adaptation. That was actually one of the questions I wanted you to clarify for the listeners. Um, what was the relationship like between the continuation movies and the continuation novels? And the answer is not really any at all. There have been a number of novelizations. John Gardner uh, wrote a couple. Raymond Benson wrote three. Oddly, those are all Pierce Brosnan era novelizations. And here's something interesting. Christopher Wood, who wrote the screenplays or co-wrote the screenplays to The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, novelized his own works, his own screenplays. That, that's, that's relatively unusual, where the guy who actually writes the screenplay novelizes or adapts his, his screenplay into a book. And they're really good. Let me, let me speak briefly about those. Uh, one is called James Bond, comma, The Spy Who Loved Me, which is different from Fleming's novel, The Spy Who Loved Me. And that's because the spy who, Fleming's The Spy Who Loved Me is nothing like the movie. He didn't like, it's told from the point of view of, of, of the Bond woman. And so he said, I don't, when he sold the film rights, he said, you can't adapt this into a film, period. Later, they, the, the Eon Productions made an, a deal with the Fleming estate to give them the title, The Spy Who Loved Me. So if you went to the bookstore after seeing Roger Moore's The Spy Who Loved Me and picked up Ian Fleming's The Spy Who Loved Me, you would have been disappointed or at least uh, surprised why there is no overlap at all. So they m made a novelization and to distinguish Fleming's The Spy Who Loved Me from the movie novelization, they called it James Bond, comma, The Spy Who Loved Me. That's, that's really fascinating. And so the one, the one other thing that's interesting about that is that this most novelizations have a bad rap of being sort of just product put out uh, and not very thoughtful. Maybe they expand on the scene. But Christopher Wood did something very interesting. He put the whole movie, of the Roger Moore movie, through a lens of Ian Fleming. So he sort of Flemingized... He wrote it as if he were as if he were Ian Fleming. He wrote it's sort of an Ian Fleming pastiche, although that's sort of a bad word because it means you know imitation. But he did. He 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 wrote uh, two novel novelizations that were written as if Fleming might have done them. And can you just tell our listeners a little bit more about some of these characters that have done this work? So we have spoke about Sir Kingsley Amos. Take us on a little narrative arc. Obviously, we won't. We don't need to touch on every single one and we don't have the time. But like throwing a stone across a lake, just touch on some some uh, to get us to where we are now. Yeah, let, let me quickly provide the, the potted history. So after, uh, after Kingsley Amos wrote uh, Colonel Sun in the 60s, there was this something, called, something that John Pearson, the Fleming biographer, wrote called uh, James Bond, the Authorized Biography of 007. And the concept of this 1973 book was that James Bond was forced to sit down and tell his life story. So in it, he go, James Bond tells his life story and tells his versions of all the events that Fleming told in his novels, as well as added to it. Uh, that was 1973. And then there were those two movie novelizations by Christopher Wood, for this bio love me and Moonraker. So that was the 70s, still no new traditional Bond novel. And it wasn't until John Gardner and 1981's License Renewed that we see the first J James Bond novel after a while. John Gardner stuck with the gig for a while. 
he wanted to just tie Fleming. He he wound up writing 16, if you include his 14 original novels, as well as his two novelizations. He had the gig through 80s and a lot of the and a lot of the 90s. Then they gave it to Raymond Benson. Raymond Benson wrote a book that is still loved today called The James Bond Bedside Companion. And then Benson wrote six novels, three novelizations, and two published short stories, including one that was not published, uh, that he gave to the Fleming estate. And they said, I don't think this, this short story is quite right. They, they, I, think they, I think they might have thought it was too much of a pastiche, but I, that, that, I, I might be wrong about that. Uh, and that's an example of the, the, the Flemings continuing their oversight. And then he wrote that, in, his last one was Die Another Day, the novelization in 2002. And then they put those adult Bond novels on pause, and they came back with two unexpected Bond spinoffs. One was called Young Bond, uh, by Charlie Higson, the Young Bond series by Charlie Higson. And he wrote five novels about the teenage Bond. And I know for many of that, us, that will sound like a terrible idea because James Bond is adult fair. And why would you consider writing a children's book? But it's, but he doesn't have Bond meeting like Minnie Blofeld or Minnie Jaws. Instead, he, he goes over Bond's emotional arc. And that, so it, it's, it's very good. And then Samantha Weinberg, writing as Kate Westbrook, wrote a trilogy of books called The Money Penny Diaries. And in those, uh, those are three books that overlap with Fleming's time, timeline. Then for the centenary of, of Fleming's centenary, we get a trio of one shots, which is to say one book per author. Sebastian Fox writing Devil May Care as as a pastiche, it was on the cover, it said writing as Ian Fleming. Uh, so he wrote one, then Jeffrey Deaver, the American, wrote uh, Devil, excuse me, wrote um, Carte Blanche, uh, which was set present day. And then William Boyd wrote one uh, that was written, that was period. Then Anthony Horowitz wrote a trilogy of books, uh, which effectively go over Bond's career. One of them is a a prequel to Casino Royale, and in it, James Bond has to find out who killed 007, which is, which is to say, who killed the, the 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 spy who held the 007 rank or code before him. And there's a middle book that takes place right after Goldfinger, and then Horowitz wrote one more that is a direct sequel to The Man with a Golden Gun. So some of these people that you're speaking about, these are quite significant novelists in their own right, right? Sebastian Folks, the author of Birdsong, um, Jeffrey Deaver, uh, The Bone Collector, which becomes a movie as well. Um, so we're, we're not talking about this is just someone that they found on, uh, on some chat site online or something, right? No, you're, you're absolutely right. And what you are identifying is the change in publishing strategy. Before that break at the centenary, uh, Gardner and Benson had been writing effectively a book a year. I mean, th there were sometimes there was a break where it was two, but we're talking about a Bond book a year for you know, nearly two decades, uh, from 81 to 2002, whatever. whatever. Someone do the math. That's not going to be me. So a long time. And then they changed their strategy and went to and wanted it to make it more of an event where they would go to quote-unquote literary authors, not thriller writers, not spy writers, not adventure writers, although Raymond Benson's first novel was uh, his James Bond novel. Could you imagine that as your first gig as a novelist, as a published novelist? And so now that's what they're doing, where they're going to these authors to write one book and turn it into an event. And now we're getting into a, a new era where... We've got the Kim Sherwood book, which is expanding, which is called Double or Nothing, and its sequel comes out later this year, A Spy Like Me. And it, as we said, it's about other agents in the double O division. And in the first one, James Bond is kidnapped. They don't know where he is. He's presumed dead. And so 
he becomes the MacGuffin and people are trying to figure out what happened to James Bond. And so they're trying to expand the stage so that James Bond is not the only character who, who we care about. Okay. This is really, really fascinating. And, and how, so you said there are over 50 continuation novels that have been, that have been given the, the sort of official blessing. Yes. Yeah. When I say 50, I'm including novelizations and spinoffs. Uh, the traditional adult James Bond are about 27, 28. Okay. So this is not including the 12 that Fleming wrote? That's correct. 12. So we are, so when, so just taking a step back, so it seems like Fleming dies, there's the Kingsley Amos one, then there's not really much activity, and then in the 80s it picks up. Um, there's novelizations in the 90s of the Pierce Brosnan movies, uh, and then for the centenary it goes to, we're going to get some heavy-hitting novelists involved, and now where we are now as the series is expanding out beyond just James Bond, it's, it's different characters, it's a, it's a whole universe like Star Wars rather than just Han Solo or Luke Skywalker. Is that, is that correct? Sort yes. <laughs> yes. No, no, you, you, you do have it correct. Um, we are going to get, we are going to continue to get Bond focus books. So there's going to be, there's going to be two tracks, as it were. There's going to be the traditional Bond focus books that everyone loves and expects. And then we're going to get these other uh, iterations. And not every book is meant to appeal to every person. The young Bond books are not meant to be read by adults, although we do. Uh, they were aimed at at teenagers. You know, they're, 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 they were aimed at that Harry Potter group. Which is a huge market. It was a tremendous market, and, and it was a very popular series for, for, for the, the young Bonds. My name is Michael Castro, and I work at the International Spy Museum uh, Security Officer. Our main objective is to observe and report, and then maintain everything in the museum secure. In a past life, I used to be a Marine. I was in from 03 to 07. I, I deployed twice to Iraq, and I was a uh, field radio operator slash MUX uh, Marine, which is a multi-channel ultra-high frequency transmitter operator. I was in charge of a radio called the Mark 142. So it was like a big metal box around 50 to 60 pounds. It was stationary. It would either be in a tent or in a Humvee, and there would be an RF cable running to it, telescopic antenna. It was a line of sight radio, so it would be pointed to another radio down about 30 miles away, and I would make sure that uh, it was running, maintain it 24-7, uh, and every month I would do a crypto run from one base to another to secure the signal in order for it not to be intercepted. And uh, we would use a, uh, what is called a uh, Kick-13, which would be like almost like a military flash drive. At the end of uh, my enlistment, I was awarded the Iraqi Campaign Medal. Um, I also had several meritorious masses and um, letter of appreciation due to my work as a radio operator over there, maintaining all the communications. When I pass through uh, one of the uh, displays, there's a little machine that looks exactly like the one that we used to transfer the data. Um, I don't know what it was called, but it looks almost similar to it. But yeah, it's I feel special to work here uh, as a security officer, and know that I'm, um, you know, I was part of that. This year, uh, for all of our listeners, uh, Officer Castro was awarded Employee of the Year. Yes, which was very, very well deserved. I want to give a shout out to the security department, everyone that uh, also works here at the Spy Museum. And if it wasn't for you guys, you know, I wouldn't have gotten that award. So I, I really, really uh, give thanks to everyone. A few follow-up questions, Mark. So... What's the market like for these books? Is it is it very large? Uh, 
you know, help me understand what's going on here in publishing terms. People are reading them. They're, you know, whenever a new book is announced, it becomes a worldwide announcement. They, they often do quite well. The idea of making them literary events by these heavy hitters also helps. The idea of appealing to different demographics, like the Double or Nothing series is doing, helps. I try not to get too much into the weeds about book sales with my book because I, it's really, it, 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 to me, it's almost irrelevant. My, my goal is to get people to, to look at the books themselves and, and try to get in my book, James Bond After Fleming, goes through all of these 50 works and devotes a chapter to each work. And each chapter, I try to explain to the reader who is probably unfamiliar with these works, what the author was trying to do. And each chapter is broken up into three different categories. One, there's a summary because most people haven't read them. And I also think that the summary shows you how intricate these things are. But then there's the observations and commentary, which is, as I said, where I try to show you what the author is doing from their point of view and how it fits into this whole literary canon. And then the third part is uh, sort of a, a Bond character study where I show what each author is doing in terms of Bond, his character, his family history, his, his work methods, his, you know, his family tree, his, his inner life, his tastes. Help me understand if there's any relationship between some of the other writers that are brought in to work on the screenplays and the continuation novels. So maybe there isn't one at all, but I'm just thinking of Roald Dahl, who worked on You Only Live Twice and, of course, The Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. George MacDonald Fraser uh, worked on Octopussy, the author of the Flashman novel series. There, there, there's a few people there that are heavy hitters, but they're never drafted in to work on the novels because it's separate streams. There's, is that correct? Well, th they definitely are separate streams. Uh, I mean, they, they have so many relationships with, where they do overlap. But for the most part, they're, they're, they're separate and should be thought of as separate. In, in the earlier times of Gardner and Benson, the, the books had a movie-like quality. The, Benson was specifically told, take the James Bond character and drop him into a Bond movie. So the, and now, and there was more overlap. You would see more signs of the movie in those books You'd, you'd see more movie references, you'd see more quips, you'd see more gadgets. Th those, were, those were heavily influenced by the movies. Now, that's not the case. Now it's ignore the movies totally and just respond to Ian Fleming's Bond. That's interesting. And then, but you know, you just mentioned Roald Dahl, is that, that, that Adventures of James Bond Jr., 003 and a half, if you look at the book, it says written by R.D. Mascot, and it says that he's a pseudonym of a well-known author, and they weren't going to tell you who, and they never really publicly did. And most people assumed, because of the James Bond connection of You Only Live Twice, as you just said, that Roald Dahl, the children's book author, wrote this James Bond children's book. He did not. It was um, Arthur Calder Ma Marshall. And just for our listeners, uh, what... Where would they go to if they wanted to say, I'm not going to get a box set of 50 novels, but I want to dip my toe into a couple. Where would they start? Would they go to Colonel Sun? Would they go to Sebastian Folks? Would they, yeah, help, help, help our listeners understand like a couple of touch points that they can go to? No, that's a great question. I, I wouldn't start at the beginning and work my, all, my way all the way through. A lot of people do start with, with Kingsley Amos. Colonel Sun, and, and that certainly makes sense. It's been recently re republished, uh, and it's generally considered to be one of the, the better ones. But it really depends on sort of what your mood is and what your your bond interest. For a modern one, I might recommend starting with Anthony Horowitz and Forever in a Day. That's the one that begins with "So 007 is dead," and the, a reference to the previous 
uh, not James Bond, but the previous guy. Uh, and that's a fun one to start with. But if you're not looking for a a pure James Bond, you could go to D Double or Nothing, which is about the, the other agents, and that's a sprawling story. Or if you want, you know, like a like a Fleming-esque spy thriller, even the, the first Money Penny Diaries will, will get you there. It's not quote unquote chick lit, uh, despite the title Money Penny Diaries. It's an uh, it's an honest to good espionage spy thriller. Yeah, there's a broad range there. If you're talking fifty novels, uh, do you have a personal favorite, Mark? No, no. That's what's so great about them is that they're, they're depending on your mood. There's something for you. And when you read the novels, do you struggle to get out of your head the image of one of the movie uh, actors? For me, I always struggle to get, well, it depends on the novel, but I always struggle to get uh, Sean Connery out of my head when I'm when I'm reading some of the novels. Do you have the same kind of issue? Yeah, when, when I first started, I absolutely did. I, I, I think I thought of them all as Roger Moore because that, that was the bond at, at the time, and then I would think I moved to Timothy Dalton. And now I sort of use uh, – there was an artist who who drew the comic strips in the Daily Express called McCluskey, uh, and I, I, I often think of him. Okay. And for the these continuation novels, what are how are some of the the standard Bond stock themes developed? So the Bond villains, the gadgets, the the ladies, the the cars. So 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 how if at all are those used? How do they evolve in in these continuation novels? Yeah, I mean you have to provide the reader with the Bond that they expect so he, he he's got to drink a martini uh, he also has to eggs his his coffee his car it's not it's not generally the the car of the films it's not generally the aston martin it, it's generally a bentley which is what he drove in, in fleming books they are all, all the authors are coming from fleming and so they're trying to replicate his the, the the form of a Bond novel, but often, as Anthony Harwood said, giving it sort of a postmodern spin. So Bond's attitudes in many of those things are fixed, but the the way those attitudes are framed often allows for modern sensibilities and, and, and beliefs as they should. And you mentioned some people that were novelists who wrote one of these books. So it was like they were a novelist who just so happened to have written a James Bond novel. But there's other there's other novelists who were, this is something that they'd done for several iterations or they, they had, they wrote a number of these James Bond novels. So is, is there one that's generally considered to be the best James Bond novelist, somebody that wrote? I don't know, two, three, four of these continuation novels? When people talk about the, the top Bond books, they often go to Kingsley Amos and they, of, they often go to Anthony Horowitz. Uh, uh, Charlie Higson and, and his young Bonds are also well regarded. And, and recently, last year, in a, in a very short time, they, ca it was, they came up with this idea of, it was parallel to the 70th anniversary of On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And they said, oh, we ought to do something about that. And they came up with on his Majesty's Secret Service to to represent the, the coronation that was taking place. So Charlie Higson, in a very short time, was asked to write a short story called on, on his Majesty's Secret Service. And he turned that into like a 42,000 word Bond novella, uh, where Bond has to keep uh, the new king safe. So they, they're, they're really responding to What's, they are trying to also be nimble enough to respond to what's going on in the outside of the world. And you're maybe biased on this question, but how much how much legs do you think Bond has? Do you see it continuing indefinitely? Obviously, it's a different type of literature, but do you see it continuing like Shakespeare, or or do you just see it living living on? Oh, oh, for sure. And I should say that I had not read all of these Bond novels before I started this this these Bond continuation novels when I first started and when I was first exposed to it, 
I didn't even know what to make of a Bond continuation novel. It did seem like an odd idea to me. And so part of this is to understand, you know, what is a continuation novel and what does it mean to take another person's character and, and, and continue him? Uh, and as it speaks to your question, yes, just like we get, you know, tons of Sherlock Holmes stories, I think Bond will continue. Certain characters don't carry on. I mean, I think Tarzan is is a character that I don't think a lot of people have found ways to realize successfully in, in modern times because it, it it so fit into what was going on at the time and in, in those attitudes. But Bond uh, has been uh, ha has adapted with the times while also trying to maintain the character's core attributes. What was your view on the last Bond movie? Um, did you have any particular thoughts as, as somebody that's done all this research on James Bond, both the novels and the movies? For the last Bond movie, I, I was absolutely gutted. Uh, it was not the ending I expected. And I remember when the lights came up, I, it was my, my, ma my mouth was on the floor. But it was also just putting my own personal emotional reaction aside, it also made sense in some way for that iteration of the character. That Those Daniel Craig Bond movies are meant to sit outside the Sean Connery, Roger Moore, George Lazenby, Timothy Dalton uh, films. It's meant not to continue those stories or be a prequel or a sequel. It's meant to be a completely different character. Uh, and so if you're doing that, that was their way of tying a, a bow on it or, or putting a final period to it. If he had not made a fifth film, they would have ended with the, with how Spectre, the fourth film ended, which was Bond driving away with, with, with a new love and with an Aston Martin. So if that happened, it would have ended on, on a happy note. But... That was not the case. And so once you end on that happy note for the fourth film, sort of like an arc in a in, in a book or, or a movie or a TV series, the, the, the next has to go the other way. So as James Bond did? In, in, that, in that universe, it, it would seem so. If they wanted to, they could continue. They could have said, no, he's all right. Ian Fleming himself tried to kill off Bond before. Uh, there are instances in the Bond books, uh, like You Only Live Twice, where Bond is presumed dead. So uh, they could, if they wanted to, write to that. And, you know, he wakes up on, a, on an island and unsure of who, who has forgotten his memory and who is he. That's sort of the You Only Live Twice, Man with the Golden Gun plot. I don't suspect they're going to do that. I think they're going to leave those Daniel Craig films discreet and start Fresh. So that's the answer. The Daniel Craig movies are a discreet package. That yeah, that's my belief. But you know the funny thing about these things is when Casino Royale came out, the, the Daniel Craig's two thousand six. If you would have asked me what that was, I would have said it's a prequel film. It's a prequel to Sean Connery. But it wasn't until like the third one when you realized, oh no, none of these, those, those the, the events that happened to James Bond in those early films could not have also happened to this James Bond. So we'll, we'll we'll find out, but I really do believe it's a discrete package. And who's working on the next novel and when is it coming out? Uh, the next James Bond novel will be the Kim Sherwood, A Spy Like Me, which is about the other agents in the 00 division who are on the hunt for James Bond and aim to rescue him. And that'll come out, I think, in April. So it seems to be from our conversation is that there's not one James Bond anymore. There's... There's different James Bonds. There's the literary James Bond. There's the Fleming James Bond. There's the Bond after Fleming Bonds. Um, there's the movie Bonds. The Daniel Craig Bond is different from the the whole Bond canon. Is that fair? There, yeah, there's, a, there's radio James Bonds. There's video games James Bonds. There are comic book James Bonds. Uh, yeah, he, he's, a, he, he's a, a malleable or a protein figure uh, who... who, who keep his core attributes but can be adapted into these different mediums and i think it's more interesting ultimately this is just my personal preference that there is not just one james bond and one overarching story that connects every single 
James Bond adventure together. I think you get more you by doing that you limit the artist's ability to take them in new directions. And just throw our listeners a little tit bit. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Um, I, I, I'm i going to, today, maybe I'm going to say cause Daniel Craig's Casino Royale. I also love Dalton and Lazenby and I even love Moonraker. Okay. Well, um, I think just to close out, can you tell our listeners where they can get a hold of your book, Bond After Fleming? Yeah, uh, uh, please do get James Bond after Fleming. I would be very grateful. Um, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you could ask your local bookstore to order it for you. And it's out just now? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks ever so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to speak to you, Mark. Thanks for listening to this episode of SpyCast. Please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have feedback, you can reach us by email at spycast at spymuseum.org or on Twitter at INTL SpyCast. Coming up in next week's show. The Zodiac case had come into the news again because of the David Fincher film that had come out. And then the cipher just intrigued me because it had been unsolved for so long. And it seemed like a... Uh, a thing that where the answer could possibly be within reach because of you know my computer programming background and my interest in puzzles if you go to our page the cyberwire.com forward slash podcasts forward slash spycast you can find links to further resources detailed show notes and full transcripts i'm aaron dietrich and your host is dr andrew hammond the rest of the team involved in the show is mike mincy memphis vaughn the third emily coletta Emily Renz, Afua Anakwa, Ariel Samuel, Elliot Pelsman, Trey Hester, and Jen Ivan. This show is brought to you from the home of the world's preeminent collection of intelligence and espionage-related artifacts, the International Spy Museum.